Right, I think we'll kick off. We're just after three. Um, some people still floating in, so um, yeah, hopefully we'll all we'll all be in soon. But uh, listen, thanks everyone for joining us today for our webinar uh, on B two B brand excellence. Um, for those of you who don't know know us, uh, we're White Bear. We're a brand and creative agency based in London and Dublin, uh, and we do a lot of brand building work for brands both B two B and B two C. And where this webinar uh, has come from is a journey we've been on around brand effectiveness for the last few years, where as an agency, we've always uh, sought to understand and prove the impact our, our brand work had for our clients to justify their uh, their investments. Um, but also we've, we've widened that out and, and have had lots of questions from clients and potential clients about understanding uh, at a deeper level brand effectiveness, brand ROI, how do I build a branding business case? How do I justify branding and brand building to financial people who aren't in the in this area? Um, and we did a talk and a white paper a few weeks ago on, on on brand ROI, which we can we can share after as well. But this talk follows um follows on the back of that um uh, and is in 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 particular in relation to B2B branding. Uh, and in response to what we've seen in the research uh, and in practice about what we think is um, our big opportunities for B2B brands to really level up. Um, we think there's uh, the standard could significantly improve and the data and research bears that out. So there's hopefully lots of um, lots of common sense stuff here, but lots of sort of quick wins as well that we think b2b brands can 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 learn from so um just flicking on my slides here making sure i have my my tech um tech sorted so yeah we're going to cover um key trends uh in b2b marketing from uh recent recent research um and translate it into what we think are pretty actionable tips to inspire um, brand planning and, and brand brand growth. Uh, it's based on uh, insights and research from some of the some of these leading uh, researchers in in the sector. Um, and you know, as I said, I, I think most of this is just good solid advice. It's not rocket science. It's implementable, and it's backed by uh, backed by data and research. So we have six key takeaways from today, and we're going to walk through each in turn. Um, but essentially, what we're saying is, uh, firstly, B2B uh, buyer profiles are changing. Um, they're getting younger, they're more digital, they have less reliance on, on human interaction, and they expect a digital first uh, approach to, to how we engage with them. So we'll talk about that. Uh, secondly, most B2B buyers aren't in market at any one, one time. And there's a lot of recent research that suggests B2B brand builders and marketers should be doing more to rethink the funnel, uh, focusing more on future customers and cash flows uh, rather than current customers in market who at any one time probably only represent 5% of the addressable market. Uh, next, uh, uh, alarmingly, nearly all B2B creative is too dull to drive sales or drive incremental sales. So we're going to share some research about how over 70% of B2B ads are too dull that they'll have no incremental impact on sales. Uh, and given that creative is the biggest lever for increasing effectiveness, this is a, a big missed opportunity. And we'll share um, why they're too dull and what can be done about it. Uh, generate memories, not just leads. So again, following on from that logic about addressing a, a wider section of the market and people who aren't actively in market, we need to be thinking about generating memories so that customers, when they do commit to market, remember our brand and remember us when it comes to a purchase decision. So that's about generating memories, not just leads. And we do that by prioritizing promise over product features. So talking less about rational features driven communications and more on promise and emotional storytelling. Uh, and then finally, to stay top of mind, um, talking, we'll talk a bit about managing media budgets more efficiently aiming for uh, recency over high, high frequency burst campaigns. So taking each of them in turn, 
uh, on B two B buyers um, um, and the, and their profile changing. We can see here that uh, over 65 percent of B two B buyers are now, uh, I would say, younger, falling into millennial and Gen Z um, categories. Uh, so obviously, generations that have grown up in the digital world and expect uh, sales journeys and marketing journeys um, effectively without human interaction um, for most of the sales process. So they're much more au fait with doing the research themselves, uh, going on a digital journey whereby you know sixty percent of them go to a supplier's website before they want to talk to anyone. They want to attend webinars hosted by a supplier to show that they're at the forefront of what they do. They conduct their own research on the supplier digitally and they evaluate suppliers and review sites. So all of this, you know, bears a strong resemblance to their B2C customer journeys. And in effect, what it means is they are happy to do a lot of the research digitally themselves and engage with suppliers digitally uh, and only talk to, to humans effectively late in the process when they're when they're ready to when they're ready to buy or ready to engage. So what that means, I suppose, at a high level is we obviously these buyers are younger, they're digital. We need to have digital processes in place to help them understand what we offer and understand how we can offer it. Um, um, uh, and that extends obviously into digital purchasing if, if feasible or if possible. We need to make customer experience a priority so they understand, so, so that we show we understand them, we understand their need states. And finally, we need to rethink content formats because people, these buyers are um, digital content savvy and they're researching um, they're researching our brands cons consistently and constantly. So we need to rethink about more, um, probably less around long white papers and more about short uh, video content, um, short short pieces of content and recent content as well, not sort of evergreen stuff that's been around for forever. So quick, um, a quick that's a quick one on on. Um, uh, buyers uh, demographics changing which probably shouldn't surprise anyone um nextly next nextly um next is this uh piece and uh, this is probably the most important precursor for the rest of the talk is that most b2b targets aren't actively in market and um you know the principle around this is that uh, and the research from Ehrenberg Bass Institute and Marketing Week says that you know as a general rule we could assume only 5% of B2B buyers are in market right now um and you know 5% isn't religious it could be 5 to 10% but as a principle it means that there's a significant proportion over 90% of buyers um that B2B marketers are should be talking to are out of market and won't buy for months or even years. Um, and, and that's sort of represented here in terms of, you know, um, mathematically in terms of a total addressable market. If you're only looking at that 5%, you can see the impact versus looking at the rest. So this principle needs to translate into, um, according to this research, into rethinking our marketing funnel from uh, the horizontal, the traditional horizontal viewpoint to this two-pronged, um, sorry, vertical to horizontal two-pronged approach where we have people who are ready to buy and customers who are out of market. Um, and th th those in market that are ready to buy represent current cash flows and, and people that we can convert. And those out of market significantly, you know, 18 times, 19 times uh, bigger addressable market uh, represent future cash flows. Um, and, you know, according to the research, reaching even a small percentage of those future buyers who aren't ready to buy and, and engaging them with your brand can produce an impact on sales that's greater than reaching current buyers. So the principle here is about focusing more on the 95 percent, more than, you know, we typically currently do. It doesn't mean neglecting the 5 percent, but it means um, building activities that focus on the 95 percent as well. Because ultimately, to grow as a brand, we need to address those out of market and for them to be familiar with us when they enter um, uh, the market to, to engage with our products or services. Because, um, and secondly, sorry, um, because those that are in market, so that sort of 5%, um, the, the research and data shows that they largely uh, use their memories of a brand to decide uh, what to buy rather than just searching for a brand. So 
And even when they do search for a brand, they prefer brands they're familiar with. And familiarity of a brand is built over time with consistent messaging. Um, so therefore, you know, we need to not overlook the importance of of advertising our, our brand building to, um, to, to reach that 95%, because ultimately when they come into market, if they're familiar with us, they will be more likely to engage and buy from us and familiarity drives sales. And the, the bringing the 95% into our consideration drives incremental growth and, and, and sales. So um, what do we do to um, address that 95% and to make sure we're not neglecting it? Um, we can ask ourselves a couple of questions. Um, is our campaign, our brand building, reaching future buyers and not just current buyers who are ready to convert? Um, is the campaign building positive mental associations and memory links for future buyers? I'm going to talk about that in a minute about how we, how we do that. So is it building something that the buyers will, you know, when they come into market will remember, oh yeah, that's, that's that brand. I associate that brand with my current need. Um, and is the campaign maximizing our brand's assets to boost brand recall? So uh, we've probably all had examples of, uh, seeing ads or campaigns from brands, either consumer or business, where we say, "Oh yeah, I wouldn't mind engaging with that when the time's right," but then you forget the name or you forget the brand, and it's and it's gone. So it's really important that we have distinctive brand assets that can help boost uh, the recall of our brand when people come into into market. Um, so that's all sort of well and good in terms of we're addressing the 100%, we know, we understand our demographics, we understand that they buy digitally, but it's actually, you know, frankly irrelevant if our creative is so poor that it won't resonate with them in the first place. And um, alarmingly, I suppose, for most brands, um, B2B ads are too dull to impact um, incremental sales and address that, address, um, address that, um, piece around uh, targeting that 95% that are that are out of market and indeed the 5%. So this um, this research shows a um, analysis of 600 B2B ads um, by the B2B Institute and it found that 71% of B2B ads uh, scored, so 71, nearly, nearly all, scored just one star out of five uh, on their rating system, their emotional response rating system. Um, and therefore, you can see at the bottom left of the graph, our forecast to generate 0% incremental sales for the brand's bottom line. So 71% aren't um, creative or emotional enough to generate any incremental sales. So obviously a huge opportunity there missed out. Um, and following on from that, um, more research from Nielsen shows that creative um, and the quality of the creative is the single biggest contributory factor to driving sales from brand building and advertising. Another research from Ehrenberg Bass finds that great creative can drive up to 10 to 20 times more sales than mediocre creative. So I suppose in a nutshell, we can optimize all the other elements, but um, you know, great targeting, great reach, et cetera. But if we can't get the creative and the brand right, um, it's a waste and nothing else really matters. Um, okay, so so a big opportunity, but what's leading to the um, what what's leading to this poor performance? Um, the research indicates that a significant um, portion of 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 what's out there in terms of B two B creative campaigns follow a very stock formula. Uh, and video content, for example, um, you know, features a voiceover over stock footage. There's no story to the to the to the content. There's no characters, um, and most alarmingly, they found like the the brand is only uh, is often only referenced um, it, it, towards the end of the um, uh, towards the end of the campaign. So people don't even don't even know what the brand is for most of us. So those first few seconds are crucial. And people aren't referencing or uh, brands aren't referencing what brand, what brand it's it's in relation to. So how can we strengthen creative? And we're going to show some examples. And um, we touched on what what bad looks like, but what good looks like is you know again it's pretty 
it's pretty obvious or logical, really. You know, it's building a story. It's using relatable characters that our customers can relate to in everyday settings. Uh, it's referencing brand cues um, early and often. So making sure our distinctive brand assets are on on show. Uh, and it's prioritizing emotion and memory building over rational and functional messaging. So, um, you know, MailChimp's a good example. I'm just going to play Look at you. <laughs> All of you, even you, dreaming up your biggest ideas yet, designing your world, and building it too, baking, shaping, and shaking it, sewing, and mowing, coding, and creating it. Sometimes overwhelmed. Could we discuss the father of God? By an often overwhelming world. Know that your ideas will flow again. You'll pick yourself up and go again. Who you're meant to be, you'll be. Because you're never gonna stop. And neither will we. So, yeah, hopefully that wasn't too loud if you blew my ears off here. But um, uh, MailChimp is a great example um, of, uh, and that's a really good example of a distinctive brand, even in the B2B space for a fairly generic product. They That campaign and most of their communications really highlight their color palette, their um, their mascot. Um, it features, that, that features a sort of, um, uh, some characters that are going through a story arc. The central character resolves her issues at the end about the overwhelming world, um, and yeah, in general, it just it follows some of those principles, and it it it's it's much more memorable than what we would typically see, um, and uh, it really leverages their distinctiveness as a brand. It's unmistakably Mailchimp, so we're not going to forget about them, um, forget about it on the back of that um, that that piece of work. Um, so moving on, um, I really like this quote, um, it, it, the way advertising works isn't by stimulating us to buy. How can it, if most of us who see an ad aren't going to buy for perhaps a year or more, um, like most people who see that MailChimp ad probably aren't ready to switch or aren't bothered switching at the time, but may in time. Um, so it works principally by building a memory link for the brand in the buyer's minds. So that memory link is activated when the buyer does come into market. So I think that's, yeah, I think it's a really nice quote that sort of de um, uh, demonstrates um, what, what we're trying to do here. And this sort of underpins um, lead gen, you know, this underpins what we've, we've been talking about. Lead gen doesn't generate most sales, memory gen does. You can see the correlation there between um, mental market share, the share in people's minds of the, the brands with, traditional market share. So this ties into what we've been talking about briefly on that 95% and addressing it with uh, campaigns that people, um, uh, that trigger memories in people for for the brand that, that you're you're talking about. So um, how do we sort of build more of these memory links and um, strengthen our creative uh, and build a brand and campaigns that um, speak to the 100% or the 95% and not uh, at the expense uh, or not in, in the 5%. Um, Yvonne's raised her hand. Hi, Yvonne. Do you want to put a, something in the chat? Um, can anyone chat? Uh, Not sure. Is there an issue? Can you not? Can you not hear me? Or is there an issue? The Q and A. Okay, hang on. Chat is deactivated. Okay, if you can stick it in the Q and A, I'll have a I'll have a look at it um, as as soon as I can. Um, I'm assuming you're still able to hear me, and I'll crack on. But um, happy to try and answer questions as we go. But I'm kind of. Um, flying solo a little bit here and don't have someone to to monitor the Q&A. So I'll keep going and maybe we can we can ask some questions at the end if that's okay, Vanessa. Um, so yeah, um, 
what we want to do here, um, just bring it back up my my screen. What we want to do here is message around. Um, re, re, uh, we want to reach the whole category. So again, we talked about speaking to that one hundred percent and ninety five percent. We need to message around several category entry points. So um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But messaging around when consumers are likely to want to engage or purchase with our brand. So like example i i really like is um category entry points for beer um so if i'm on a beach and i want a beer i'm not going to think of guinness i'm going to think of corona and likewise if i'm in a, a warm pub in winter i'll probably think of guinness rather than corona so it's like having your brand uh assigned or aligned with categ various category entry points that are relevant to who you're trying to talk to um and like mailchimp for example might be you know when when my existing or when I when my existing um mailer platform isn't fit for purpose or I'm not able to do certain things with it or I'm not able to to speak to my target audience using it. So and then the last one is branding everything. So speaking um uh speaking and showing your brand identity across everything. There's no point in doing creative that doesn't um showcase your brand or showcases it too late in the in the story and customers won't remember the brand that they're they're engaging with. Um, just moving on here. Um, I will leave this behind in terms of identifying category entry points, but I'm going to give an, uh, an example now of a brand that does this really well. Um, but this is a, a diagram of how you can identify category entry points to build your messaging around. Um, and an example of someone who does this really well, um, I think is, is Plio. Um, they um, they're an expenses platform um, that helps automate expenses essentially, and the campaign they did in uh, in London, I think I think last year, uh, was was really built around broadening their reach and appealing to people who aren't necessarily in market, uh, and they built it really cleverly um, around um, you know these pain points that we would all experience as part of the expense process, like working late, having to do your expenses, um, uh, overwhelmed with paperwork and trying to, you know, take photos of your receipts, um, stress over invoices, having awkward conversations with people about um, expenses they're trying to trying to approve. Um, so it's, it, it's built around these uh, pain points and, and I suppose entry points, but it's also really well branded. Um, it's like um, it, it showcases their brand color. It showcases their distinct illustration style um, and it's in their own tone of voice. So it's unmistakably Clio um, and it's it's really memorable. Um, so again, this is a really good example of something that um, has reach outside of the 5% who are ready to buy is, um, is branded everywhere and references uh, various uh, category um, category um entry points so um what else do we have that could help build those memory links so people remember our brand when they're when they're ready to uh when they're ready to buy um a really interesting one that's um that that's very underutilized and very powerful in b2b is the use of what what are called fluent devices which is a an, another name or fancy name for um, brand mascots or characters essentially um, and use you know their characters or mascots used by the brand as the vehicle to drive drama or drive engagement across their campaign so obviously we just saw a little bit of that with MailChimp and their um, iconic mascot and I think you know all of us are probably familiar with B to C mascots and the power of them but really interestingly if we look at the data for B2B, um, we can see that um, ads uh, ads with a character or a fluent device can be up to twice as effective um, than those without. Um, and yet in B2B advertising, less than 1% of brands are making use of them. And I think we're starting to see more of it now, a little bit there with MailChimp, um, Sage have started to adopt some of it uh, and we're starting to see more of some of these principles come to bear, but obviously this is a real, this could be a real opportunity for um, for for B two B brands. 
um we've done we built a um we built a brand around a um uh, around a fluent device for a work workplace uh, wellness um uh, monitoring tool called Stribe um and they're competing against um probably more rational type um um uh products like Office Vibe or Pecan that um probably don't hero as much the human element of team well-being and office well-being. So what we wanted to do was lean into that differentiation and talk to the element of um, the element of employee well-being that, you know, um, um, people are people, they're not numbers, they're not data. And whilst it's lovely to see how they're doing out of 10 and how they're feeling, uh, ultimately what we want to do is tap into how they're feeling and why they're feeling like that. So building this fluent device that would change the illustration would change as and when people are feeling differently to represent the workplace and represent how people feel um was was really powerful and um they've since gone on to you know grow significantly we've won a number of uh, transform awards for the impact that that branding work did um had on their identity um but that's an example of a of a uh, fluent device in in b2b brand world and then in sort of the campaign world another example you know it, it's it's important to note and here's an example that they don't need to be animated or illustrated they can just be people real life heroes uh and in this example uh chase business bank uh built a campaign around uh, i think a customer there is called sweet bee farm so uh they they had their own characters if you like they were real life people uh, and it made the campaign really memorable and relatable for other business owners in similar stages of their of their um, trajectory. So I think in some, um, it's an interesting area that is uh, really underutilized in the B two B space. So it would be worth considering if if uh, you have the capacity to do so. Um, another way to maximize the memorability of what we do. So people remember our brand and engage with it in the future is to um, make the most of the this uh, peak end rule, which is essentially uh, where we judge or remember an experience, not in its entirety, um, but by the experience's peak moment of intensity and how we felt right at the end of the experience. Um, so there's studies that show uh, like 30 second ads with one peak uh, and branding at that peak moment were twice as likely to be recalled correctly. Um, while um, brands with one to two minute ads containing multiple peaks were three times more likely to be recalled. So this means developing content um, that it, it, where the creative needs to include one peak emotional moment uh, and that the brand is featured heavily in that peak moment uh, and, and at the end. Um, so this is another example, I, I think, you guys were raising your hands because the the sound didn't play um didn't play last time uh, you might raise your hands if that's the case and I'll try and fix it um if not I'll I'll crack on if I don't see any raised hands because it's another example with with sound okay um from a young age we're told to grow relatives comment on it doctors track it and parents encourage it but once we're older, we begin to obsess over it. Somewhere along the way, growth becomes our ultimate goal, our only goal, something to be achieved at any cost. So we compromise our values. We mislead. We put our customers at risk. We trade trust for a payout and choose what's easy instead of what's right. The world says you must be cold, cruel, and cutthroat to succeed. We disagree. Here at HubSpot, we believe it's not enough for businesses to grow. They need to grow better. But what exactly does that mean? Growing better is remembering you're helping people with unique needs and dreams. It's letting them interact with you on their terms, not yours. Growing better is adding value before seeking a reward. It's more than what you sell. It's whether those you sell to succeed. Growing better is placing long-term relationships ahead of short-term gains. It's staying true to your values and making the right decisions, even when they're not the easy ones. Growing better is succeeding with a soul. 
At HubSpot, we've made it our mission to create a platform and community that help you do just that. Because when our customers succeed, we do too. Grow better with HubSpot. So yeah, I think that's it. I personally think it's a bit long, but it does have this narrative to a peak moment, emotional moment. It even stops the soundtrack to land the important message that it disagrees with Cole's cutthroat growth. And in that moment, they they share, you know, it shows their iconic logo and color palette. It's front and center. So doing that builds that memory links that we're talking about um, and a memory link between the brand and positive business growth. Um, so um, moving on, um, what do what do all of the campaigns we've discussed so far have in common? Um, and what they have in common is that the hero product promise over product features and they hero storytelling and emotional storytelling over rational uh, feature features driven communications so this quote sums it up you know products alone don't build emotional connections promises do they don't products don't speak to customers promises do and um, products don't build customer relationships but great promises really really do so um, the B2B Institute sort of summed this up with, you know, if if Coca-Cola marketed themselves like a B2B brand, it would look something like this. They functionally describe themselves as sweet, brown and fizzy. They talk about how 95 percent of people agree that they solve the thirst problem and they talk about multi discount um, buyers, buys, and they probably put it behind a, a detailed white paper talking about uh, B2B Coke. Um, and, you know, they raise the question, you know, the, why do B2B brands communicate like this? And it's it's fundamentally down to this assumption that um, a lot of it is down to this assumption that in B2B decision making is profoundly more rational than in B2C, which is just not the case. If we think about it, we're still selling to people, um, you know, whose uh, you know decisions B2B decisions could could ultimately be more emotional and more important than what they're making in their own B2C personal lives because they're doing this in a professional capacity. And the data bears this out. Um, you, you can see here that, you know, up to 70% of B2B decision-making is uh, decision-makers place emotion either ahead of or on a par with rationality, which is only uh, a little bit behind uh, B2C. So when our campaigns and our brands are built around emotional response, we are uh, acknowledging um, that uh, uh, humans are at the other end of this um, are at the other, other end of this campaign and value emotional storytelling and uh, decision making uh, equal or greater than uh, rational decision making. So this slide sort of sort of sums it up you know um if if we like a brand we tend to hold positive beliefs about its benefits um so any advertising that makes a brand uh, makes someone like a b2b brand more is more likely they're more likely to assess and improve their assessment of its products or services so effectively it has a knock-on effect on that five percent because they like the brand when they've seen built more positive emotional connections to it and then when they're ready to buy they, they view its services and products and more rational stuff in a more favorable light. So it's kind of a double double whammy. Um, so who does this well? I think I mentioned Sage and there's probably better examples of what they're doing out there, but they've they've gone through a big rebrand the last couple of years where they've um, gone down and, and utilized a lot of the principles we're talking about where you can see here, there's a nice illustration. It's really simple. It's branded. There's memorable an animations. It's messaging around a specific category uh, entry point if you're self-employed or if it's time for, uh, it's it's the end of the tax year, make it a breeze, uh, do it with confidence. Um, and, you know, it's all built around um, building those memory links. The brand is really distinct. That green is unmistakable. Um, and it's also demonstrating the relief that they would provide from, you know, the annoyance of of tax returns. Um, last one is around uh, last last sort of um, conclusion, if you like, is around um, uh, media recency over media 
frequency in order to boost this brand recall that we've we've talked about extensively. Um, some of the data here shows, you know, what what happens when we stop advertising or when we no longer put ourselves out there effectively. And you can see there that the say the, the the drop off is is pretty consistent and dramatic. You know, in the first few months there's a loss of momentum, and then in the following months the preference of the brand and the category drops. Uh, the brand loses the top position among customers who would have previously ranked it up there and shortlisted it in the category. And finally, it loses, uh, you know, all category association within time. Um, so this is sort of, um, you know, this analogy of um, the the ad spend is like like its engines. Once the engines stop, the pre the plane, uh, the plane will eventually start to descend over time. Um, and it's it's like it, it, it's something that we need to consider in terms of staying top of mind consistently because obviously the long buying cycles in B2B and we don't know necessarily when people are going to enter into that ready to buy um, ready to ready to buy period. We need to stay in top of mind frequently and not just on one off basis. So what we think, you know, the most effective and um, cost effective way to stay top of mind is to focus um, to focus on these um uh, these these shorter shorter burst and maintain the brand on with sort of uh, lower spend higher frequency um content campaign um webinars thought leadership etc so essentially it keeps you um it keeps the brand front of mind over time so that when someone comes to buy you're front of mind and it hasn't been too long since they've been exposed to the brand so like the gray dots here represent what's what would happen in a high frequency campaign which would be a high burst of impressions over a short period of time but the yellow dot is is more about recency and doing it more frequently building impressions over time and they can re, you know demonstrate and i suppose how they can refresh those memory structures so people are consistently reminded of the brand and that familiarity builds over time um so avoiding that memory corrosion if you like of not people not being exposed to your your brand i think we we, we would talk about high frequency um avoiding high frequency launch and leave campaigns and um, do more recency campaigns generating the impressions over time and maintaining consistent always on approach low frequency campaigns doesn't have to be high spend it's just staying that that front of mind consistently over time um so yeah, sort of bringing that all together, there's sort of five or six conclusions and, you know, there's a lot in this and hopefully it's it'll be digestible either as I talk through it or when I send the deck. But, you know, if we were to sum up the six or so learnings in practice, I think we're what what we're seeing is obviously the pro, B2B profile, um, uh, B2B buyer profiles are changing. We talked about the being younger and more digital, so we need to stay on top of that and we need to prioritize digital customer journeys and we need to look at short, more short form um, content formats and video to stay um, consistently top of mind and empower them to do the research that they want to do digitally um, uh, before buying. Um, B2B buyers aren't actively in market, so we talked about planning uh, campaigns for future cash flows. We talked about where budgets allow opt for the broader reach campaigns that here is distinctive brand assets. The Plio example being a perfect example of that. So broader reach, branding, everything, getting in front of customers that may not necessarily be ready to buy so that you can grow market share as and when they do come into into uh, into market. Um, yeah, most, most B2B creative is too dull to drive sales. So what can we do? We don't want to be among that 70%. We need to work our content around story arcs. We talked about featuring characters. We talked about um, it being relatable in relatable situations. We talked about branding the content and referencing the brand consistently so that people don't forget it's your brand. Um, and we talked about maximizing those emotional peaks and, and connecting it to your brand and, and doing that at the right time. Um, we talked about generating memories, not just leads. Um, and again, those memories being really important for when uh, br um, for breeding f familiarity and, and for when those buyers will come into market to buy. So we need to hero, we could hero characters in our communications. 
Um, we can uh, we can add images and quotes from key employees. We can make sure our video content contains at least one emotional peak. Make sure our brand is front and center, and people understand that we're referencing our brand and not someone else's. Uh, we talked about prioritizing promise over product, so um, we need to we need to acknowledge the emotional benefits our product offers. We need to speak in relatable stories, not just in facts and 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 data. Remember that people are people and humans are primed to remember stories and not data. So how do we do that? We talk talk um, build some of those storytelling arcs that we talked about earlier. Um, and yeah, the the bit about we we can risk brand recall and sales with high frequency burst campaigns. So let's opt for recency campaigns, always on low frequency, um, keeping in touch, keeping front of mind consistently. So that's kind of the um, the whistle stop tour um, checklist here. I think is really useful. It just summarizes what we what we've talked about. Um, right from brand into campaign content and media um and hopefully gives a it gives a nice summary of what what we've we've been through i think there's a lot we've gone through in quite a short space of time so i'll be sharing um i'll be sharing the deck and happy to sort of take take any questions or to have follow up um a follow up session with anyone that wants to go through some of this stuff and learn what you can potentially do with uh with your own um uh, with your own brand so yeah if there's any questions let me know if not thank you for listening and uh, hope to see you all or speak to you all again soon Uh, Anna, is the impact of the recent recency big for B2B year over year or also month over month? I mean, is the impact on sales visible also if you don't advertise for a couple of months or even four months? Um, or should you totally stop for almost a year to start seeing the impact? Obviously, um, yeah, I think Anna, what you're asking is it is it is it um is it a full year for you to see the impact? I mean, the study was based on stopping for a year, but equally, you know what based on what i was discussing particularly in point six about staying front of mind and, and maintaining always on communications uh i would i would advise not to not to stop uh even for the four months if you can keep um an always on approach great um but the data and the the study was based on um on over a year so uh, i would just uh get back to it if you can um yeah so I think that's it. There's no more no more questions unless anyone has any. And I'm happy to pick that up with you separately as well if that didn't um if that if that was too quick. Um okay, Brill. Well look, uh, thanks everyone. I will share the deck and uh hope to see you all again uh, soon. I hope that was useful. Thanks guys. Bye.